G'day guys, my name is Ben and you're watching The Long Gun Project. Now in this episode, we're going to be doing a how-to on using the Applied Ballistics app in your phone. Now there are two reasons why I decided to do this video. The first is I've been asked a couple of times by a few people to do a video like this to explain how to use the Applied Ballistics app. The second and the main reason is that my mate Jay at Orange Accuracy has just released a set of long range shooting training videos on his website, which you can either rent or buy. Now, if you want to improve your long range shooting, I can't recommend Jay's training enough. Now, if you can't get to one of Jay's training courses, then a really good place to start is his online training video series. So if you do go on Jay's course, you will actually be required to download the Applied Ballistics app to your mobile phone if you don't have a Kestrel, and that will be what you'll use throughout the course. So this really supports his training course if you're about to go on it. Now, if you're getting into long range shooting and you're looking for a reliable ballistics application to support your long range shooting, or you've downloaded Applied Ballistics, but you've struggled to make it work, then stay with me and hopefully I'll help solve some of the issues or unravel some of the, the mystery associated with getting Applied Ballistics up and running because it is a really great app. Now before we go any further, does this look or sound familiar? Oh man. I've, I've put everything in, like, you know, it is for like a correction tougher, whatever that is, like I don't need correction stuff, which you know for that. Well you want the better BC, like the bigger one. Um, I, I, got, I got the velocity off the, off the box. If these guys don't know what the velocity of their own ammunition is, mate, then what, what hope have we got? Then, my mate let me use his crony, and, and I, I put the velocity in for that, and it still didn't work, mate. This ballistic app is bogus, man. I'm, I'm just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download something else. Now, if that video is, like, kind of you, or a mate, if it is you, first thing, don't tell anyone it's you. But second... This is probably the video that you've been looking for for quite some time. So please stick with me. I'll step you through everything using the Applied Ballistics mobile app on your phone from setting up your gun profile right through to truing your muzzle velocity to get your data spot on. So first thing you're going to need to do is get your phone and download the Applied Ballistics mobile app. Now, if you just type in Applied Ballistics into the App Store, you'll probably see something coming up like this. That is the one that you need to purchase. So the next step is we're going to go into building your gun profile. Now, obviously you'll need your rifle and a measuring device. In this case, we're gonna be using a pair of dial calipers, but a ruler will suffice. It's quite okay. Okay guys, now let's dive right into the app. So when you download the app, you'll end up with this icon here. So let's open it up. First thing you'll be confronted with is a blank screen. So what we actually need to do you step into the preferences. So with your preferences, this will allow you to sort a whole bunch of different stuff. So firearm sorting order. Let's go oldest to newest. Um, ammunition sorting order, same thing. So you can then go distance units. Um, because we're in Australia and we're doing a lot of metric stuff, we'll probably go meters. Um, atmospherics units, again, we'll probably go metric. Um, other units tend to be things like uh, velocities and lots of stuff, which is in feet per second. So we'll probably go Imperial for that. Um, we'll leave wind angle units in clock format, uh, lead angle unit, um, we'll leave that in clock format. Um, these environmental things, look, don't, don't get too wrapped up in those. Um, if you're going to use automatic latitude to calculate for Coriolis and that kind of stuff, um, then by all means turn on your, your GPS and all that sort of stuff. Um, but for the most part, I leave spin drift on and Coriolis off for most of the shooting distances that I'm likely to do with this app. So you can dive right into these, but generally, all I'm going to be looking at is the units of measure and the sorting orders and that kind of stuff. So once we've gone and done that, 
So the rifle we have in front of us today is the fantastic Lithgow LA-105 in 6.5 Creedmoor. So let's go ahead and build that gun profile in the program. So first thing we'll do is we'll go up to the top here and press that little plus button. And then you'll be confronted with a menu like this. So first thing we'll do is we'll put a name in for it. So in this case, it is a Lithgow LA-105. 105, 6.5 Creedmoor. Now it is asking us for a barrel twist rate. Now this is normally stamped on the left hand side of the barrel. So ours in this case being a 6.5 Creedmoor is a one in eight twist and the twist direction is a right hand twist. So that's already selected for us. Sight height is set at a default setting of 1.5 inches. When the app is asking for the sight height, it's asking for the distance between the center of the bolt raceway and the center of the scope. Now, how do we measure that? Take a set of calipers and we'll measure from the center of the bolt raceway to the center of the scope ring. There we go. Okay, and that gives us a reading of 2.170 inches. Now we measured it and it was 2.170 inches. So sight offset, you would only use sight offset if the sight was off to one side. So in this case, we don't touch that. So if you tap on reticle, it will allow you to select from a bunch of different reticle patterns. Um, in this case, um, the reticle for the fantastic Carl's 318i isn't in the menu. Now, you don't need to get worried about that too much. Um, I know that the Bushnell G3 reticle is a Christmas tree reticle, it's kind of similar. So we'll just go ahead and we'll select that. Now, it's asking here for first focal plane, yes or no, and you've got the other reticle, true magnification, low magnification, and high magnification. Now, if you have a second focal plane scope, and by that I mean if you're, when you zoom in, your crosshairs stay the same size, then you have a second focal plane scope. If your crosshairs zoom or get larger and smaller as you apply or, or reduce the zoom, then you've got a first focal plane scope. Now, if you have a second focal plane scope, what we would do is we would put in the upper and lower magnification range for the scope. And generally speaking, unless stated otherwise, the true reticle magnification is at the top end of the zoom range. So let's say we had a second focal plane, uh, Night Force SHV. So the low magnification uh, for the reticle is five, the high magnification is 25, and the true magnification would be at the very top end at 25 power zoom. So that's if it was a second focal plane scope. In this case, the 318i is a first focal plane scope. So we just tick that and that grays out all of this area here. So you don't need to worry about it. Now, uh, the elevation unit for this scope is in mils, which is a metric thing, which is really great. Um, if it is, if you do have a scope in MOA, that's no problem at all. You can choose. Um, the turret graduation, MOA is done in essentially quarters. So you've got one quarter, half, three quarters, and one full MOA. So depending on whether or not your scope is in minutes of angle, inches per 100 yards, or in this case, mils, is you know, all part of the, the selection menu. So in our case, it's mils. So we'll select mils, and mils are graduated in one in 10. Windage units are mils as well, same level of graduation, one in 10, and the lead unit is mils because the rest of the turrets graduated in mils. Now, correction factor. What's a correction factor, I hear you ask? Good question. A correction factor allows you to correct for any error that you discover in the elevational windage adjustments of your scope. What do I mean by that? you'll have some windage and elevation adjustments. It'll either be minutes of angle or it'll be mils, generally. So, if you dial one mil 
but it actually turns out that one mil, because of the way the scope's manufactured, there's an error there. One mil isn't quite one mil, it's like, you know, 95% of that, or it's 110% of that. And the same with minutes of angle. If you dial four minutes of angle, but it's actually in reality about 4.2 minutes of angle, the correction factor allows you to adjust for that in your ballistic app so that you don't have to throw the scope away. The scope is still fine, it's just a little bit out. But if you determine what that error margin is, you can correct for that and your scope is still usable. Now, how do you find your correction factor? Well, that's where the tall target test comes in. Now, what is a tall target test? Okay, the tall target test allows you to do two things. It allows you to check whether or not your scope is plumb, and by that I mean the vertical line of your crosshair is aligned with the bore of your rifle, and see if it is canted either left or right, which can cause major issues downrange at long distances. It also allows you to measure the adjustment of your scope and determine whether or not you need to apply a correction factor. So, how do you do a tall target test? Well, the good news is you can do a tall target test at your local range at a normal distance like 100 meters. So now that you know how important a tall target test is, I'm gonna show you how to do one. A great place to do your tall target test is at the range, and you can do it at 100 meters, that's perfect. Now, when you get there, you need to take either a blank piece of cardboard or you take a target and you turn it to the blank side. You then put it up and then you take your spirit level and your marker pen and you mark a level line and then you mark a vertical line in an upside down T formation. Now, you're probably thinking, why wouldn't I just draw that on up at the firing point and then move down and fix it onto the target frame? The reason that we do it on the target when it's already on the target frame is if you did it at the firing point, you're more likely to then walk down and fix it to the target frame in a way that you think is level. But if the target frame more than likely isn't level because it's been shot at, run slightly downhill or whatever it is, naturally as human beings, we're going to try and align it with what's ever in front of us. So what we're trying to do is break away from that and we're using an actual spirit level and a marker pen to put a horizontal line and a vertical line in an upside down T formation like this. So now that we have our true horizontal line and true vertical line, this allows you, even without a level on your rifle, to be able to align your vertical crosshair and your horizontal crosshairs. And your aiming mark is going to be there. Now when you aim here, you'll fire your first group at this aiming mark with the rifle zeroed. You'll get a nice little group down here. Once you've got that, we then need to dial the scope a known amount. In this case, let's say we dial up three mils. That should give us 30 centimeters. Now, if we fire our group, and we get shots here, here, all around this area here, that means that we've got a scope that is aligned vertically with the bore of the rifle. That's a great result. If you've got a group out here or a group out here, it means that we have cant. Now, if that happens, then you need to loosen off your scope rings and you need to rotate that scope until your group starts falling on this vertical line. So that's part one of the tall target test. Part two is once your rounds are falling on that vertical line, we then need to measure it. Now, when we measure it, we are measuring to make sure that the number of mils that we've dialed equates to the distance that our group has traveled along that vertical line. So the mean point of impact, which is the approximate center of your group from here 
to the approximate center of your group there needs to be the dialed amount. If it's not, then we use an equation to figure out what the correction factor needs to be, and then we enter that into our ballistic app. So the last part of the tall target test is obtaining your correction factor. Now, how do we do this? Well, we take the expected point of impact shift and we divide it by the observed point of impact shift. Now, let's say in this case, we're at a 100 meter range and we dialed three mils of elevation. Now, at 100 meters, 0.1 of a mil is one centimeter. So, if we've dialed three mils at 100 meters, that means that we would expect to see a point of impact shift of 30 centimeters. Now, let's suppose we've dialed three mils and our rounds have landed on the center line as predicted, and we go down to measure and the mean point of impact is 28.5 centimeters, not the expected 30. What we then do is we take our expected point of impact shift, which is 30, divide it by the observed point of impact shift, which is 28.5, and that gives us our correction factor, which in this case would be 1.05. So, in the app where it looks for or asks for a correction factor, in the elevation component, you would type in 1.05, and that will allow the app to effectively compensate for the fact that there is some inaccuracy in the dial of your scope. That's all it is, that's what it does. If you haven't done a tool target test, do not mess with this part of the app's settings. Leave them as one. That's all you need to do, guys. As a result of our tool target test, as discussed, we have a correction factor of 1.05. So, let's just get in there. Okay, 1.05. So notice we've only applied that to the elevation because we haven't tested the windage. Now, as a general rule, I don't dial windage, I hold. So in this case, I'm only going to be applying the correction factor to the elevation. Then we simply hit done. Now we have a gun profile. Now you can slide this to the left, delete it or edit the the same menu that we've just done. So we can then adjust this as required if we change scopes um, or anything like that on the, on the rifle changes. Now, at this point, we then go and we are about to build an ammunition profile. Now we're going to build an ammunition profile for this rifle. So the ammunition that we're using is the American Gunner factory ammo, which is 140 grain hollow point boat tail match projectile. So, how do we build this? Well, you simply tap on the gun that you've just built. Now this will bring up an ammunition list. Now, if you press the little plus button, at the bottom you'll have two options. You can choose to either enter the details of the projectile manually, or you can choose from the bullet library. Now, manually, you've got the ability to change every single parameter about the projectile. You can name it, you nominate its diameter, weight, length, um, your velocity, your muzzle velocity variation, your powder temperature, um, atmospheric standards, your drag model, your BC, you can enter all of that manually. But if you choose from the bullet library, that's a real advantage because if it's in the bullet library, it means that the applied ballistics team have shot these projectiles in real world conditions normalize them to atmospheric standards and the ballistic coefficient that is listed is a true ballistic coefficient. It's not something that's plucked off a box. So in this case, uh, we're shooting 6.5 Creedmoor. So our bullet is a 0.64 diameter projectile. Now you then have a list of projectile manufacturers. So in this case, we're gonna go down to Hornady and now we've got a list of the different projectiles that we can choose. So we'll just scroll down until we find the one we're looking for. And here we have the Hornady Hollow Point Match 140 grain projectile. So that's our, that's our projectile. So we're just gonna hit that. And it already comes up with the name, the diameter, the weight, 
and the bullet length. Now, bullet length is important because it actually affects your spin drift calculations. Now, muzzle velocity says um, it's set at a default of 3,000 feet per second. Now, that's pretty fast. So this ammunition is probably going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 2750, not 275, 2750 feet per second. Now, that's not exact, and to be honest, that doesn't matter because we'll get into truing a little bit later. Now, muzzle velocity variation. So this is asking for a, vari a variation of feet per second per degree of temperature increase. Now, you don't have to put this in, but as you know, temperature does change your velocity. Um, so if you can put something conservative in there, like 0.3 feet per second per degree, then you're gonna be pretty close to the mark and it's not gonna harm your calculations too much. Now, there is testing that you can do, um, cooling your rounds down and also warming them up and checking the velocities across chronograph at that point in time, but um, again, it's, it's a bit involved and we won't get into it here. Powder temperature, well, minus 17 degrees Celsius is not right. We're gonna have the powder temp set at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, drag model. You got a couple of choices. You got G1 or you got G7. Now, which one should you choose? Now, a lot of guys will go, oh, G1, because the number's bigger. Let's have a look at what a G1 ballistic coefficient profile looks like. So this is a G1 standard projectile. Now, if we look at the G7 standard projectile, you can see that the G7 standard projectile more closely resembles the long range hunting and long range shooting projectiles that we see and we use on a regular basis. Now, you are going to have a drag curve that is better matched to your long range shooting bullet if you select a G7 ballistic coefficient. So in this case, we, if we were to choose the G1, we'd have a BC of 0.556. Ooh, gee, that's gotta be good, right? Change it to G7, that number drops. It doesn't really matter, guys. The G7 drag curve is a closer match to the kind of long range shooting projectiles that you're gonna be using. So if you've got the choice, choose the G7. Now, here's the best part about applied ballistics. It says, purchase CDM. Now, what is a CDM? CDM stands for Custom Drag Model. So, what applied ballistics have done is they've shot this projectile and they, they have plotted its path across its entire trajectory and they have created a drag model that matches the actual drag curve of this actual projectile. So, if you want, you can purchase this. There we go. So we can, for $2.99, we can purchase this drag model. So let's purchase that. Ooh, thank you. Okay, so now, now when we look at drag model, we've actually got a choice of three, G1, G7, and custom. Now, when you select custom, your drag model just says custom. It doesn't, it doesn't show anything else and you don't need to worry about it because the drag model that you've selected is a custom drag model and it will match the drag model of the projectile that you're actually shooting. Now, our zero range in this case isn't 91 meters, which is 100 yards, it's 100 meters. Okay, zero height and zero offset. What it's asking for there is if you've zeroed a certain amount or certain measurement higher than your aiming point at that distance. Now, I don't do that. Um, it's kind of common with hunting situations and that sort of stuff where people will zero a, an inch and a half high at 100 meters or whatever. I zero at 100 meters and have no offset and no zero height. Now, one of the things we can choose here is to enable the zero atmosphere. Now, what this allows us to do is record the conditions in which we zeroed our rifle. So, let's look at adding this in. So, pressure, let's go 
1014 hectopascals. Um, the temperature, let's say 20 degrees, and the humidity was, let's say, 45%. So now we have the full profile of this ammunition in place with a custom drag model that matches the exactly matches the uh, the projectile that we're firing and we've entered the atmospheric conditions that we zeroed the rifle in so we can now hit done and now we have an ammunition to go with our rifle so from the top of the menu we've got the lithgow and inside the lithgow profile we have the hornady hollow point match projectile, zeroed at 100 meters. All right, now the next thing we're going to do is we can go into the ammunition, and this is where we start getting down to the nitty gritty of how we actually obtain a firing solution from the app. Now, you have some options here. You can load targets. So load targets, you can actually enter a name for the target, and Let's try that again. Target one. And you can start entering different parameters for a number of different targets, if you wish. So you can be out in the field in a static position with a number of targets in front of you, and you can enter the details for all these different targets if you want, um, including you know, the you know, things like movement, speed, and angle, yeah, you can do that on moving targets if you wish. Um, wind speeds in meters a second, you've got your wind angle in a clock ray method, and you can add your uh, latitude and your direction that you're facing, or the direction that the target's facing in order to obtain your Coriolis effect. Let's just go back and let's just work on developing a, uh, a drop table. So, um, here we can do a number of different things. Now, you've got a bunch of these different tiles down the side here. Now, you can choose these and you can put a target size in there. Let's say we've got a 10 inch target um, and the size in the reticle is, and this is in minutes of angle, which is not very helpful. Um, let's say it's one minute of angle. That will actually provide you with a range to your target. So you don't have to do your milling formula um, or mill relation formula in order to obtain this. But what you can do is just, let's say we'll type in a thousand meters and then it asks for a look angle. Now what you can do is you're then confronted with this. And essentially what you could do is you start the timer and the idea is that you lay this flat you lay your phone flat on the top of the um, turret of your rifle when it's on the target. And what this will do is it will calculate the angle at which your, yeah, let's say we sit it like that. It'll calculate the angle at which your target is in relation to the horizontal. And that is also then included in the calculations for your, your shot, your firing solution. In this case, we're just going to put zero because we're shooting on a flat surface. Now, movement speed, we're shooting at static targets, so it's not really an issue. Now, here we have load station atmosphere. Now, in terms of loading your atmospherics, this is really, really important to you obtaining a good firing solution. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can enter it manually, and you can obtain that whether from a range of different sources, or you can hit load station atmosphere. And what this will do is it will obtain, you can see how all this has changed. Let me just do that again. Okay, say so two meters. Um, okay, humidity 20%. Okay, so what we'll do, so this will take the atmospheric conditions from a weather station. Now, your weather stations are generally located places like airports and that kind of stuff. So the airport's not that far away from here, so a firing solution generated from data from that point would be pretty handy. 
So let's just hit that again. And it will load the altitude, the barometric pressure, the temperature, humidity, wind speed, and angle. Now wind speed and angle, I would probably enter that manually so that you get a far better you know, wind angle and firing solution for your current location. And let's just say it's coming from four, not five. So spin drift, we're gonna keep that enabled. And for Coriolis effect, we're just gonna leave that off for the time being because we're not gonna be shooting at sort of extended distances. So at this point in time, we can leave that off. If you're gonna turn it on, then you do need to get your latitude and your azimuth entered each time. So if you don't wanna be bothered doing that, I would leave it off, especially for targets under say a thousand meters. Now, there's a couple of different things we can do after we've entered all our target data in there. Now, we can either go to this icon at the top, the little arc. Um, that is a drop table, and it has a few other functions. The other one is the, looks like a, a rifle sight, a reticle, and that is essentially our heads-up display. Now, it has a reticle, which you can zoom in on, now, this isn't an exact reticle that is in the current scope, but it's an approximation. But if we go to the heads-up display, what we can actually do from here, so we can change the target distances in five meter increments to whatever range we have for them. We can change the wind speed and the direction that it's coming from. And this all adjusts automatically for our elevation, our wind hold, and our lead. Now, because we haven't got a moving target and we didn't enter a speed for that movement, we don't have any lead at all. And what it will do, right down the bottom here, it'll actually tell us what our velocity is at the point of impact at that distance. So that's how much velocity we've got. That's the energy and the time of flight is 1.486 seconds. So a lot of useful information in this. And it's, as you can see here, because of the temperature difference, because we entered the temperature uh, at which we created our zero for the ammunition. It's already allowed us to have an adjustment to the muzzle velocity of the rifle. So we put our ammunition in at 20 degrees at the time we zeroed and the weather has loaded at uh, seven degrees. So we've actually already got a decrease in muzzle velocity on the basis that we've got a drop in temperature. So from here we can change our target distances, increase our wind speed, change the direction that it's coming from, and do all that, and it will give us an immediate indication of what our wind holds are and what our dial-ups are. Now, when we're back in the environment page, we can then press the arc icon, and this will take us to a data table. Now, in this data table, it starts at zero, as you can see there, and it will tell us what the path in inches is, the path in mils, drift in inches, drift in mils, velocity at different ranges, energy, and time of flight in seconds. And it'll go all the way up to the maximum range that we've listed. In this case, we've listed it at 820 meters. So in these 25 meter increments on the side here, and you can adjust the increments of these distances if you wish in your preferences you can get a table like this. So you can either run off a table or you can run off the heads up display. It's entirely up to you. But when you're in here, there's a couple of different things you can do. You've just got the plain reticle and it will give you your holdovers, as you can see there. You've got all your holdovers at different ranges, including your spin drift and your wind. And you've also got a graph. This graph is interesting in that it shows you your muzzle velocity you drop and the over distance. So one thing it does is you can compare. So if you had two different ammunition types and they were substantially different, um, you could choose to compare them and use the graph and you would have a separate set of lines that illustrate the other ammunition type. So you can actually compare two ammunition types under the same set of conditions using that graph, which is kind of cool. So, this is the, the table arrangement, and those are the functions, your reticle, your graph. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, great, I'm all set, gonna go out there and slay steel, and you will. 
you need to get out onto the range or into the field and you need to start shooting targets as far away as possible. But when you do that, you are probably, in all likelihood, going to notice a difference between what applied ballistics is telling you you need to dial to hit the target and what you actually need to dial to hit the target. Now, this doesn't mean that the app is broken or rubbish and you need to go find another one. Quite the opposite. You're now at the point where you need to do a process called truing. What is truing and why is it important? The first thing to remember is the bullet doesn't lie. So whatever is happening downrange is what we're working with, regardless of what the app is telling us. What we need to do is we need to calibrate the app to the performance of the projectile in your rifle in your current atmospheric conditions. Once you've done that, then your data is going to be so much more accurate that you will notice a huge change in your hit predictability with the app. Until you've trued your data, you are probably still going to remain frustrated at the errors that you're seeing in terms of what the app's telling you and what you're seeing in front of you. So, the final piece of the puzzle is truing. Now, how do we true our app and the data in it to what we're seeing? First thing to remember is that when we're truing data, the greatest variation is likely to come from our muzzle velocity. Now, you're probably thinking, I didn't get my velocity off the box, I got mine off the chronograph. And that's great, but chronographs at the consumer level are relatively cheap and, unfortunately, not as accurate as what real-world physics is. So how do we true our data? Right, first thing we do is we go into the table and we go up to the little plus sign at the top here. And it'll ask us to show lead, ballistic calibration, send and cancel. So what we're looking for is ballistic calibration. So press that. Now what it'll do, it'll provide us with a bunch of parameters here to run a ballistic calibration. Now, bear in mind that these are ideals and you may not have, probably don't have the room to be able to do this kind of shooting at your local range. But if you're out in the field, you might have the, the space to do this, but it'll give you a couple of parameters. So the first thing to do is, let's just look at range one. And this is probably the most achievable for most shooters. It'll ask us to have a range between 825 and 1125 meters. So let's say we've got a steel plate and we've managed to get it to 975 meters. Now, the next part is where you're going to shoot. So for 975 meters, it's telling us that our elevation needs to be 11 mils. So we would dial 11 mils on the rifle and we would shoot our target. Now, truing data is essentially taking the information that we've put into the app and the outputs it's given us and testing that in the real world to see if we need to make any corrections. And generally speaking, we do. So let's have a look at what happens next. So in this case, we fire a bunch of rounds and they all strike the plate in a rough group with the mean point of impact central but low. With that in mind, we know that we want our rounds to be striking the center of the plate at this distance. So what we then do is we dial up on the scope until our rounds start impacting with a mean point of impact in the center of the plate. And we take a note of what increase in elevation is required to get there. In this case, let's say that is 0 0.2 mils of elevation. So the difference between what the app initially gave us and what we require to hit the center of our target is 0.2 mils. So that's the difference between what the app initially provided and what we are now gonna put back into the app to finally true our muzzle velocity. So we've completed the first half of our truing process, which is shooting the target. So we dialed the required 11 mils of elevation for the 975 meter target and found that it actually required 11.2 mils of elevation to hit the center of that plate. So now we actually go through the truing process. To do that, 
you come up to the little plus symbol and you select ballistic calibration off the bottom here. Now this is important because this will allow you to hit your targets at all ranges because your muzzle velocity is going to be more accurate. Now, it says there range one needed to be between 825 and 1125 meters. Now, luckily for us, our plate was at 975. So it puts it in that range. And really at this point in time, all we're really worried about is range one. Range two and range three are for shooting into subsonic and it'll provide a thing called a drop scale factor. If you're not shooting into the subsonic region, then I wouldn't worry about that at all. What you need to do is just work on the range number one at this point in time so that you can obtain an accurate muzzle velocity for when you're in the supersonic range. So in this case, it asks for drop one and what we're looking to put in there is the drop that we actually had to dial to get rounds on the center of the plate. So in this case, it was actually 11.2 mils. Now, once we've got the range that our target's at and the actual drop that we needed to shoot to hit the center of the plate, we then hit run. Now what it does here is it back calculates a true muzzle velocity. So this is a muzzle velocity that is back calculated from the atmospheric conditions and the ballistic coefficient of the projectile and what that projectile needed to be doing in terms of velocity in order to hit that target at that place. What we actually have is a true muzzle velocity of 2667.81 feet per second. So then it will ask you to apply the calibration. So what this will do is this will change your muzzle velocity back in your ammunition profile. And that's a good thing because that muzzle velocity is the true muzzle velocity for that ammunition type and that will then carry across for that ammunition type in your gun profile and your ammunition profile for the rest of your shooting calculation. So we will hit apply calibration. And if we scroll right down to the bottom of the table, you can see that that's changed from 2750 to 2667.8. Now don't be alarmed when you go back your projectile pro like your ammunition profile will still read 2750. You've already applied a calibration to it so you don't need to worry about that. From here on in you are calibrated. You have a true muzzle velocity, your data is true for that ammunition type. Well guys, that concludes this video on how to use the Applied Ballistics mobile app on your phone. I really hope you got a lot out of it and you find this useful. If you have, please don't forget to hit like and also subscribe. But if you get a chance, share it with anybody that you think might benefit from using this video. Guys, thanks again for watching. If you are looking to improve your long range shooting ability and you can't get to a course, then please look up the online long range shooting training at Orange Accuracy. You can find that in the link below. Guys, thanks again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you all again on the next episode of The Long Gun Project. See you later.